I'd like to welcome you to uh, our second event in a recent series of talks um, uh, featuring Bruce Party today. I'll get Will to introduce him in a moment, but before we do that, I would just like to uh, mention a couple of things about our, our group, our Heterodox Academy group at Laurier. Uh, I'd also like to point out um, a little bit about some of our early successes or wins already that we may have had on campus. Uh, our last event uh, featured Lisa Bildy, who's a lawyer who uh, perhaps most uh, is most well known for defending Amy Hamm, among other um, cases often involving freedom of speech. Uh, now, during that, we uh, to advertise the event, we tried to get it posted on My Learning Space, which is our university's course management system. Now, this involves um, submitting a variety of information to the My Learning Space uh, information, uh, whatever it's called. But what we do is we, you can see that what they want to know is event postings for specific groups of students uh, are not the type of things you want. It should be something that's for all students that everyone could be interested in. So you can see a couple of examples of a hawk hunt sort of thing. Now, what we did is, is we submitted this and we were rejected. Uh, they said, uh, this is not from an administrative unit or a faculty or a department, we won't be posting it. So I sent them a notice that here's an example of a student group, it's not an administrative unit, and they posted it. Uh, and they, the next morning, said, we'll post it. So we got it posted, and uh, this was fine. It was up first thing in the morning. And very shortly after, we saw many other messages pop up like this. Eco feels navigating climate emotions <laughs> together. The Burr Social Justice and Healing Group that's restricted to closed group for, I guess, black, indigenous, and racialized, and I think some uh, gender queer, gender not conforming people. Okay, so this suggested to us that, in fact, um, well, it was good that we got this on, but clearly there's a lot of political information going up and ours didn't quite fit the normal political um, band, I suppose. So I went to do the same thing with Bruce's talk, and they responded and said, we've actually changed it. The provost's office has come up with new rules, and we won't be posting anything like this anymore. So now it's very much about weather, emergencies, closures, very straightforward things. So you can see this has been up here since March 14th about some scholarships. Very boring, very <laughs> apolitical. I would consider that a win. Um, so, <laughs> I, I think, um, anyway, I just wanted to point that out as an early success story for our little group. We can make a difference. Um, but now I'd like to go ahead and, and turn the floor over to Will, who's going to introduce Bruce. Okay, I've got a brief introduction for Bruce, but then a bombshell landed on the National Post yesterday from one Jordan B. Peterson. <laughs> titled, A Rotten, Rotting Universities. <laughs> Elite institutions are whale carcasses filled with parasites, is the subhead. <laughs> and uh, here, I just want to read you the opening paragraph. There's been a spate of articles written lately by academics who have become disaffected by the happenings in our much vaunted institutions of higher education. Most vocal and well-known of these are such luminaries as Jonathan Haidt, who started the Heterodox Academy, uh, Jay Bettacherry at Stanford, Stephen Pinker at Harvard. In Canada, Gad Saad at Concordia is likely the most effective and well-known of such critics, although Bruce Party <laughs> and David Haskell, <laughs> Julie Panais and Janice Fiumengo quickly sprang to mind I was left <laughs> off the list. <laughs> <laughs> okay, just had to bring that up. So, um, this is our second event, and we're privileged to have another lawyer, uh, Bruce Party from the Queen's Faculty of Law. Uh, Queen's, is a, uh, Queen's is a friend of mine. Bruce is a friend of mine. <laughs> uh, and so I guess that, that uh, it, and, and we became friends after the uh, Lindsay Shepard affair. Uh, I kind of found out about his work, and, and uh, I've been unaware of these goings on. So, so Bruce is on leave right now. Uh, he's um, the executive director of Rights Probe, which is a division of Energy Probe Research Foundation, which is a, a Canadian think tank. He's also a senior fellow at the Fraser Institute. Don't want to hear any criticism. I worked there for a year. <laughs> uh, 
Bruce helped create the Running Meat Society, which produces written and podcast content on their website and organizes speaking events and debates at law schools across Canada, which is really cool. Uh, Bruce was heavily involved with Lisa Bildy in the Stop Saw campaign um, and had a big win there. Uh, prior to the pandemic, Bruce was organizing an annual lecture series at Queen's called the New Liberty, New Liberty Lecture Series. I attended the 2019 lecture by Amy Wax. I don't know, Google her name if you don't know it. That was fun. I missed 2018, which was the big one. That was with Jordan B. Peterson. And you rem may remember scenes of students surrounding Grant Hall and pounding on the stained glass windows and shouting, lock them in and burn it down. Oh. <laughs> yeah, a, a proud day for Queens. Uh, and we've got your Queens. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> nice. so. Can we get around <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to cancel my subscription yeah, to the okay. uh, Graduate Magazine. <laughs> so, <laughs> Bruce is truly a public intellectual, and he has expertise in many topic areas. And you'll see him write on civil rights, free speech, particularly Supreme Court decisions, climate regulation, indigenous relations, university administration, human rights and human rights commissions, feminism, uh, and of course the big one, the culture wars and, and the world corruption uh, of the universities. Uh, if, if you want to follow, he writes uh, regularly in the National Post and Epic Times. Um, Couple of things about Bruce. Uh, I like to think of myself as fairly right wing libertarian. Uh, one economist, Ed Laurie, calls me right of Attila the Hunt. <laughs> and I'm regularly challenged in my thinking by Bruce, who always seems to be a little bit more liberal than I am. I recently proposed a policy idea to him, and he responded with, well, what about having no policy at all? <laughs> what about the government just withdraws from that arena? And I'm like, damn, I wish I'd thought of that. <laughs> what I really appreciate about Bruce and what you're going to see from his presentation is beyond his intellect and clear thinking, it's a sense of humor. And one bit of humor that tickled me pink was uh, early on reading some of his work, he was critiquing the Supreme Court's reasoning in the Trinity Western Law School case. And he compared the court's invocation of charter values to the film The Castle, where the lawyer bases his constitutional argument on the vibe of the thing. <laughs> it's a great movie, The Castle. Highly recommend it. So today, Bruce is going to talk about an error in constitutional reasoning that has turned equality into equity and free speech into censorship. Please join me in giving a warm round of applause to Professor Bruce Carter. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Uh, it's really great to be here amongst uh, friends, Will, Jeff, Michael, thank you very much. Uh, I want to tell you today about a, I'll tell you a story, basically. And that story, if it works, will persuade you, perhaps, that Everything you know about our constitutional order is wrong. But I want to start with something that you already know. You may not realize that you know it, but you do. Let's start with this. This is the Charter of Rights. Everybody knows. This is the Freedom of Expression, Section 2. Everyone has the following fundamental freedoms. And then, you know, A, B, C, D. B is freedom of expression. Now, what can we tell from those nine words? I'm going to suggest to you that the one thing that you know for sure from reading those words is that you do not have free speech. But it says that you do. That's exactly what it says that you do. So how do we know that you don't? Well, it only takes one example. Let's 
let's design one. Imagine you go up to somebody on the street. You sidle up to them and you say, give me your wallet or I'll stab you in the heart. Speech. Words. It's also an assault. It's illegal. It's a criminal act. But the Charter says freedom of speech. The point is that that's not absolute. And therefore, it's not actually a true statement. The freedom of speech that you have is a line somewhere in the middle of that. And on one side of that line, the courts are going to say your speech is protected, can't be interfered with. And on the other side of the line, it's fair game. And who decides where the line is? Not you. It's the court. And our courts in Canada, in my opinion, have made a complete hash of that provision. Now, it makes sense to me that you should not be allowed to go up to somebody on the street and threaten them with violence. That's, that's my line in the sand. Once speech becomes violence, then okay. But that's not what it says. And where our courts have drawn the line, using these words, and these words only, as well as the famous reasonable limits clause in section 1, our courts, and especially our Supreme Court, has led us to the point where the provisions in the proposed Bill C-63, the online harms bill, are crafted so as to be constitutional. This is what Section 13 of the proposed um, Act says. It is a discriminatory practice to communicate hate speech likely to foment detestation or vilification of an individual or group, yada, yada, yada. Now, that language, and especially this phrase here, comes from the Supreme Court when they, a number of years ago, took one of these kinds of clauses in, a, in the uh, Saskatchewan Human Rights Code and decided this is fine. You can make hateful speech illegal, even though it says everybody has the freedom of speech. So, my point is this. We are under not the rule of law, or even the rule of the Constitution, but under the rule of the court. The court will tell you whether or not what you've done is protected by the words of the Constitution that actually don't say. Here's, here's an example of the, an existing law. It's been on the books for a while. This is the BC Human Rights Act. It basically says what C63 proposes to say, which is a person must not express any statement that indicates discrimination or is likely to expose a person or a group or class of persons to hatred or contempt. Okay? That's already in our law. And so everybody making a fuss about C63, don't get me wrong, I, I agree with them. But they're very late to the game. We already have these. These restrictions, basically censorship, on the ideas you can express in the public realm. This one wouldn't apply to your internet expression, but it applies when you get on the proverbial soapbox in the park. There are certain things you cannot say in a country with constitutionally protected free speech. Now in the U.S., they have a statement which is similar to ours. 
And their law on free speech is completely different. Now, it's not absolute either. Assault is still prohibited in the US, as is other kinds of things like commercial advertising. So it's not pure, but it's different. The kinds of speech that might be prohibited in Canada as quote hate speech probably would be protected in the US and any law purporting to limit it might very well be held to be constitutional. Now, recently, oh, I'll get back to that in a minute. So, and these things come and go. I mean, there's, there's, there's peaks and valleys in the jurisprudence over time in the US and in Canada on these things. But the basic point is, you cannot read the words of our constitution and know what rights you actually have. And you know what? You know this. People make the joke all the time. But it depends upon what the court feels like this day. That's the truth. Let's try another one. Here's section 15. This is the equality provision. You see, it's a lot longer than the free speech guarantee. Every individual is, look, look how many ways you're equal in this provision. Every individual is equal before and under, and has the right to equal, equal protection and equal benefit. Before, under, protection and benefit. And look who holds the right. Who holds the right? Every individual. Every single one. Now what kind of discrimination does it prohibit? It prohibits distinguishing between people on the basis of one of these factors. In other words, this section purports to say that every individual will be treated as an individual and will be subject to the same rules and standards as everybody else without regard your sex and your gender and your race and your ethnicity and your disability and so on. We don't care. This is the justice is blind provision. We don't care who you are. We are going to make and apply rules without regard to whatever group identities that you might think you claim. I'll look back to the map. So here's, here's, I'm going to give you the uh, situation in the most recent case, big case, that the Supreme Court of Canada decided under this section. Here's the scenario. Talking about the RCMP. And the charter applies to the RCMP because the RCMP is part of government. So the RCMP, this is a, quite a number of years ago, over 20 years ago. They instituted a program wherein their members could decide, if they wanted to, to job share. I, I take it up until that point, everybody who was a member of the RCMP was a full-time member. There were no part-timers. But they put in this program. And they said, you know what? To give you more flexibility, if you want to, you can partner up with another person or another two people if you want to, and you can share a job. You can go half time if you want to. And if you do that, we are going to continue to provide you with a pension. And that pension will be calculated on the same basis as everybody else's pension, which is your pension benefits will accrue in accordance with the hours that you work. So if you want to, you can decide to, let's say, go half-time, and the pension that you get at the end of the day will reflect the fact that you are half-time. Okay? It was challenged under Section 15 as not equal. 
Here's what happened. Over, per, over time, more women than men chose to job share. And for that reason, more women than men ended up with pensions that were lower than the men who had chosen to work part time. And the argument was, well, but this rule affects women differently than men. The Supreme Court of Canada said, yeah, yes, it does. This program is unconstitutional. It cannot be allowed. You cannot have equal rules for everybody. You must craft your rules so that they affect different people from different groups in the same way to produce equal or comparable outcomes. Are you grasping the implications? The Supreme Court of Canada is suggesting that the government, the RCMP in this case, but the government generally, maybe, maybe, is not allowed to have equal rules for everybody. Uh, so, and this, this idea has, it, just, it didn't maybe originate with that case because that case is fairly recent, but, we, but we've been on this trend for a while. In fact, pretty much ever since the first case under Section 15 of the Charter has taken this tack. It hasn't gone quite as far as that, but we've taken this tack. And that idea has now sifted through the human rights jurisprudence. So there's the Charter and there's the Human Rights Code. And the Charter applies only to government, but the Human Rights Code applies to everybody. And you can see in the Human Rights Code here, this is the Humanitarian Human Rights Code, this is one of the sections that says no discrimination. Every person has a right to equal treatment, yada, 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 and mm -hmm. this, this one is for employment, but this one with service, and so on. Okay. No discrimination. Now, just let me do a, a, a tangent for a moment. When you see one of these things, whether it's Section 15 or a section of the Human Rights Code, and it says no discrimination, just check that. Let's just back up a step. People think, for this reason, that discrimination in the law is illegal. And it's not. In fact, you might go so far as to say that every law on the books discriminates. Every single one. What do I mean by that? Well, to discriminate means to tell apart and treat different. Okay, so let's consider a very basic rule. Let's say, let's consider the criminal code prohibition against murder. That provision discriminates. It discriminates between people who murder and people who don't and treats them differently. That's discrimination, not unlawful discrimination. That's the good kind. That's why we have laws to discriminate between this and that. It's drawing the lines. Here's what you can do, here's what you can't do. That's discrimination. So, when tell, if somebody tells you that discrimination is illegal, you correct them. Every law in the books discriminates. It's just a specific kind of discrimination. So what do we mean? What's the good discrimination and what's the bad discrimination? The bad discrimination, let's go back to this, is that discrimination that treats individuals differently, not based upon their actions. If you decide to murder somebody, you get the full force of the law against you but on the basis of some kind of characteristic that has nothing to do with your actions or your decisions. That's the bad discrimination. And this is where we get the idea that the same rules and standards should be applied to everybody. So back to the Human Rights Code. 
Every person has a right to equal treatment. Equal treatment means the same rules and standards apply to everybody. So here's a case. There's a, a, a high school student who goes to sign up for a summer program sponsored by the Ontario government. He applies, otherwise qualifies, but is rejected. The reason he's rejected is that he is white. And the program is designed for black students. And so his father files a complaint under the Human Rights Code. And the tribunal says this. It says, an allegation of racial discrimination is not one that can be claimed by people who are white. Everybody is equal, but not you. We have slipped from one idea to the other, and here are the two competing ideas about equality. The first is the one I've been harping on. This is the blind justice idea, the idea that the same rules and standards apply to everybody, regardless of who you are. And the other idea is, if you like, the opposite. And the opposite is that different rules and standards should apply to different groups of people so as to try to achieve equal or comparable outcomes between groups. And if you take on that tact, that gives you license to do this. And that now is the prevailing view of what these sections mean. Uh, that's another one, don't worry about that. So here's the 14th Amendment. This is, a, again, the American comparison. The American Constitution says less about equality than the Canadian one. Again, here's the Canadian one. The whole big paragraph saying over and over again how you must be treated equally. It includes the phrase equal protection. That's the phrase you find in the 14th Amendment of the U.S., nor denies the one that applies to the states. Equal protection of the laws. Now, quite recently, the Supreme Court of the United States, you might have heard of the Harvard case. This is the case where the admission policies of Harvard and the University of North Carolina were challenged because they were admitting people based upon their race. Allowing some in and rejecting others on the basis of whether or not they would make up a, a, a diverse student population like the way they want. And under this clause, the U.S. Supreme Court said, you can't do that. You cannot distinguish people on the basis of race. It is inconsistent with the Constitution. That doesn't mean you can't take a person's individual history into account and decide whether or not their particular circumstances have led them to achieve things. Okay. But you can't say we want this many of those people and that many of these people. Because now you are doing exactly what the Constitution prohibits. And note this. You can't tell that on the basis of text. If you compare that text with that one, it's not obvious that those two things mean different things. But in the jurisprudence of these two countries, they essentially now more or less mean the opposite. So, where does this get us? Well, first thing is, I'd like to suggest that this ought to be the section of the charter. The only section you really need. <laughs> you have the fundamental freedoms that courts decide from time to time that you ought to have. <laughs> if you feel like the charter means more than that and gives you more comfort than that, then you are fooling yourself. Because the court has the power to decide. 
So how did we get here? This brings me to the mistake. Our original problem was the king. When I say our, I don't mean our. I mean way back when. Back to England. And over a period of time, the king, whoever it was, was a tyrant. And at certain periods of time, that tyrant basically could do anything he wanted. The king's word was the law. Off with her head. You, know, you don't want to get yourself in that situation because there were no other protections. And then over a very long period of time, a very gradual process, we, our ancestors, the English ancestors that brought us to the civilization that we have today, Slow process of taking power away from the king. I'm not going to go through the whole history. Just a couple of highlights. You know, the Magna Carta. King John was a particularly awful king. And a bunch of barons got together and told the king, no. You know what? No. This is the beginning, the first words of the Magna Carta. And if you go through the document, you'll see it listed a whole bunch of things that these barons are telling the king that he's not allowed to do. Here's one. No free man, and by the way, free man was not everybody. Didn't include the serfs. They were in a feudal society. The serfs were attached to the land. What they meant was people like us. We're the barons. We have property. These protections apply to us. So this was not suddenly equality in the law. This is just a first step along the way. But this is a Part of the process of taking power away from the king. Magna Carta 1215, here's the Civil Rights Act following the Glorious Revolution. In 1688, the pretended power of suspending of laws or the execution of laws by legal authority, the monarch, without consent of Parliament, is illegal. Okay, what are we doing? We're shifting power from the king to the legislature. Here's Edmund Carrington, 1765. Edmund Carrington, there's a guy who writes stuff that's critical of the king. And the king sends his men to raid his house and take his papers because they want to charge him with sedition. And they barge in. They have this warrant given by a magistrate. And this man, whose place has been invaded, says, this is a trespass. Show me your authority to barge into my house and take my stuff. Takes him to court. And the, and the crown, the king, these individuals who are who have been sued for trespass, say, we have a warrant from the magistrate, and this is the kind of thing that we've done. This is the kind of thing the king must do in order to maintain order. We've done this forever. What's the problem? And the court says, show me the law that gives you authority to do this. <clears throat> Surely there must be one. Because... If it is a law, it will be written down in our books. And if it's not there, it doesn't exist. The court's saying, King, you do not have the authority. The legislature will decide. They will make the rules. If they give you authority to do this, then okay. But if not, <coughs> sorry, mate, you're out of luck. This was found to be a trespass. Right. So what do we got? We have the king being dispowered and the legislature assuming power. We're traveling from royal supremacy, if you like, to legislative supremacy. And why? Well, because the legislature is the, is the, is the, 
is the body of the people. Legislatures, at least partially, and more today, at least partially are elected and answerable to the people. And so this is a good thing. This is a democratization, if you like, of our governing system. Great. Except legislatures can be tyrants too. And over time, they did a lot of the bad stuff that you might have found the king to have done. Taking your property, imprisoning you without due process, censoring your speech, and so on and so forth. And so what did we do then? Well, the Americans did it way before we did. The Americans invented their Bill of Rights. And they tried to put a fence, a limitation, on what legislatures could do. And then in 1982, we did the same thing, sort of. We created constitutional rights, and we took power from the legislature, and we gave it to the court, which is where we are now. Actually, that's not entirely true. That story is not complete. Yes, we are now into an era of at least partial judicial supremacy. That's part of the problem. But we'll go, we even go further than that. Because today, our courts and our legislature are together doing something else as well. And that something else is to give power back to the king. Now, it's not the king anymore. The king is just a figurehead. But it is the executive branch of government, which is what the king was, and now consists of this thing called the administrative state. And more and more, as time goes on, our legislature and our courts are giving the administrative state the discretionary power basically to do whatever it wants. And that was the problem with the king, to start with. This is the mistake. All we've done from the very beginning is move power around. We didn't go far enough. We moved it around from here to there, and then from there to there, and then from there to there, as though that was going to rescue us from the tyranny of authority. Instead, what we should have said is, we're not just going to move the power, we're going to take it away. Now, here's the way this last step happened. Okay, you have the state, right? You've probably seen this. You think of the state as being in three bits. The administration, which was the king, the executive branch. We have the legislature, and we have the courts. And this is an especially American idea. They have a better expressed, more distinct separation of powers in their constitutional order than in the parliamentary system. But nevertheless, let's, let's run with it, because we have it at least in part. The legislature makes the rules. The administration implements and executes, enforces those rules. They do what they're told. Here's what the rules are. The rules give this branch its job, its mandate. And then the courts take those rules and apply them to the cases. And the idea was that that structure would, would provide all of us with liberty. Why? Because it meant, or was supposed to mean, that nobody in this system could themselves alone say, off with your head. Because they made the rules without knowing what the facts were, because it hadn't happened yet. And they couldn't make the rules. All they could do is apply the ones that were given to them. And these guys, these guys were powerless. 
and <coughs> do whatever they were told. And the idea is terrific. But as time goes on, this is, this is part, if you like, part separation of powers is part and parcel of this broader idea called the rule of law. But as time goes on, time went on, the people in charge here found they didn't like the rule of law very much. Because it got in the way of them solving the problems that they thought it was their job to solve. And so what has happened is, the legislature and the courts, the legislature has delegated authority to the administration. They pass statutes. And sure, there's a few rules sometimes in those statutes. But what they also almost universally do is delegate authority to the legislature, the, to the administration, the executive branch, to go off and make more rules. Regulations and guidelines and policies, and sometimes they're written down and sometimes they're not, and sometimes they're made up on the spot, but they have the discretion. And the courts, for their money, their job, remember back to Intake and Carrington that I mentioned to you, the case about the trespass? Well, they said in that case, look, King, you can't do nothing unless the law says you can. Well, now, courts defer. They don't apply that rule strictly. They say, well, you know, if there's an agency of some kind of dealing with the problem that they have the mandate to solve, and they're interpreting their piece of legislation, and maybe it's not quite right, but we're going to defer to their expertise. We don't want to interfere. The legislature and the courts together are facilitating the king, or at least what has become of the king, control over us. I call this the unholy trinity of the administrative state. Delegation, deference, leads to discretion. They were supposed to be checks and balances on each other. Instead, they're all working together. Yeah, I don't mean they don't have disputes between them. They do. And you'll see court cases in which the court says, that wasn't good. Sure. But in the big picture sense, they are all on the same page. They all agree that it is necessary to have a large, encompassing, discretionary, managerial state. In fact, our Supreme Court has, in, in, in certain kinds of cases, has gone out of its way to interpret the language of the Constitution so as to make sure that that is possible. And the problem is that the whole idea of our constitutional order is based upon authority. The assumption is that somebody, whether it's the king, whether it's the legislature, whether it's the courts, whether it's the bureaucrats, somebody always has the authority to tell you what to do. Somebody does. So, if we, if we were to do this differently, if we were to do it again, what is the other choice? How about consent? Instead of authority, the idea of consent. Now, consent is encapsulating the idea of individual sovereignty, if you want to put it that way. The premise of a constitutional order being that nothing may happen to you, and I mean nothing may happen to you without your 
individual consent. Now, there's going to be a lot of problems that arise. This is going to be a very different kind of thing. And those problems will have to be worked out. Like, what does this mean? What are the implications? What are the consequences? Sure. But it means, first and foremost, that it's not a question of, you know, which of these bodies, which of these individuals, which of these officials has the power at this moment to tell me what I must and must not do. Here are two of the categories of consequences. If you start with this idea, the first one is this. It means that your fellow citizens are not able to coerce you, not able to apply force against you without your consent. What that means is that a lot of the laws that you know and love, like the prohibition against murder, like the prohibition against theft, like, like compensation for injury, and so on and so forth down the line, like, like your property rights, like your personal rights, like, like your, your right to inform consent. All of those things remain. Because those ideas are already ideas that are based upon consent. But down here, this is the big change. Aside from one, that one basic legal proposition, which becomes all kinds of other particular rules, that one basic legal proposition, aside from that one, that you are not to be subject to any law that prescribes your behavior without your explicit individual consent. And that means that the state cannot interfere with you unless you are interfering with somebody else. Now, if, you, if you'd like to, just for a moment, consider the rationales that have been offered for justifying the system that we have. You know, we take commands from Parliament and from our provincial legislature. Why? Well, because we're in a democracy and the majority decides, or we're part of a social contract. You've heard this theory? Social contract theory. Social contract theory basically says, you know, the population has implicitly agreed to be governed in this way. And in exchange for the promise to obey, our governments, those who govern us, who rule over us, will provide certain things. They'll be responsible in the democratic sense. Uh, they'll provide us with services, a certain degree of safety, and so on and so forth. Okay. It's just one of the various ways that have been tried to explain and legitimize the system that we have. Okay? Yeah. Let's just call a spade a spade. Social contract theory, bunk. It's complete fiction, right? I mean, Maybe I was away that day, <laughs> but nobody ever asked me. I haven't agreed to any contract. A contract means offer and acceptance. Okay? So it's just, a, it's, just a, it's just an academic theory, a, a legal theory idea, so as to say, yeah, it's fine the way it is. Okay? Baloney. It's not true. Here's the truth. Laws are applied and enforced with force. That's all there is. I pay my taxes for no other reason than if I don't, I will get in trouble. Not because of social contract, it's not because I'm ethical, it's not because of democracy. It's not because I agree. It's only because I don't want to get into trouble. And I will get into trouble because eventually, at the end of the day, 
after I've refused and refused and refused and refused and refused and refused, they'll give me lots of chances, sure. But at the end of the day, the very end of the line, the police will come to my door. And if I still refuse, I will be guilty of contempt of court, and they will put me in prison. That is the force of the state. That is what all laws are based on. And that's the thing that has to come away. Except for this one. This is the one exception, right? This is the paradox of the law. In order for, the, in order for us to have a legal system, a legal order, that prohibits the application of force and coercion on the people, you have to have a legal system that will apply that rule with force. Otherwise, it's not a rule. Okay? So there is always that one exception. So what I'm suggesting to you is that our conception of rights, our cost of constitutional rights, of human rights, is completely backwards. They do not mean anything like we imagine them to mean. They are not central to the system. They are not where our law begins. They are mere glosses on the central proposition. And that central proposition is authority. If we have a system of legislative supremacy, that means the legislature, and I mean this quite literally, in a system of legislative supremacy, the legislature can do anything, like anything, if they legislate it to be so. They can take away your property, they can throw you in jail, they can censor your speech, they can take your children, they can do anything they want. Okay. And the only limitation on that is these rights, uh, this, right, this rights idea but as we started with, those rights depend upon the court. So the idea of rights is just to manage and manipulate which of these two bodies has the final say. It's not you. It's one of those two. And maybe even the third, given the discretion that they've been given. Okay? So I would like to throw this idea of individual rights out as a mere gloss on the system that we have and instead look at the order itself. Change the premise of the order. Don't start where we started. Don't move the power around. Let's take it away. I think maybe we all stop there and uh, we can have a conversation. Thank you very much. Okay, Q and A time. Uh, couple, one rule, uh, one rule? consent. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, the rule is you have to have a question right and not a diatribe, and it has to be brief and to the point. And if it's not, I'm going to cut you off. Uh, so okay, okay. <laughs> now it's uh, not going to work without force. Uh, I need a big person. Yeah, a big stick. Uh, it speaks softly. It's very big stick. That's what. Uh, yeah. So, Professor Cardi, where is the constitution of consent from tribe? Never. Nowhere. And uh, so, based on that answer, how do you get there? Oh, God. Who the hell knows? <laughs> right? So, this is not a plan. I, I'm not suggesting that we enter into a process of amending our constitution. That's not feasible, especially right now. And if it was, to open up the Constitution to new ideas, if it was, I might suggest that we don't do that right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because whatever we got, it's going to get worse. Right. Right. So the point of this is to try to think about what's wrong and why. So that we at least have an idea about what maybe could work better. I grant you that getting from A to B is going to be very difficult, probably not in my lifetime. I don't know, but it's an explanation more than anything else. Isn't that bad? Right. Mike. So the concept of consent, I'm hoping that maybe you can 
explain it a little bit again. I got I got stuck on the part where it's coercion. Okay, so uh, you it's um, they, you cannot be coerced unless there's consent. But doesn't coercion negate or sort of like? Well, consent. How do, you, how do you prove that they weren't coerced to consent? Okay, so let's distinguish between two things. And, and here's here's a qualification. You're still going to need courts. This is not doing away with courts, right? Because courts are supposed to, and always has been supposed to, been in the business of resolving facts, factual disputes. Okay, so there's going to be factual disputes about whether or not you've consented. Let's say there's an, uh, you know, somebody is accused of assault. Let's say somebody is accused of tackling somebody else in the street, and the and the person who did the tackling has been accused says. No, we do this all the time. This, this person has consented to this. He talked with me last Tuesday. Okay? Now you have a factual dispute. Okay? That's not unusual. You're going to get that. That is going to have to remain in the hands of the court. You're going to need some kind of third party who is supposed to be objective and neutral to resolve that dispute. No question. Uh, but, the, but the factual indeterminacy is different from the idea that well, people maybe can interfere with you. So it's, we're trying to distinguish between the, the, the rule and the fact. Does that, does that help at all? No. No. Specifically <laughs> <laughs> uh, with coercion, okay? So yes. in, like, for example, in the porn industry, and I know this is a topic that you love. Oh, yes. Did you read Louise Perry's book, uh, the one about the, the case against the sexual revolution? I mm, have not read it. No. Okay, so she talks about this, and this is where I'm getting this is where the idea of consent is where I sort of start to question it. Okay. Um, the idea is that everybody who participates in the porn industry is consenting to do so. Yes. Um, and she talks about consent not being enough because many of these women were coerced. Right. Um, but when you are being coerced, yes. whether it's that or something else, you may not know what's happening, mm. or you may be so afraid. That it, 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 but it becomes almost impossible to prove later that you were coerced. So, like, you could be afraid for your life, or you could, and people could go on for you know 10, 20 years sure. in a contract sure. which they were coerced. Like, sure. how would you deal with that? You know, in a okay. So let's let's back up. I, I, and so when you get into a difficult problem with respect to a a sticky subject matter, which is what that is. What I like to do is to leave the subject and put and create the same kind of scenario in a different context so you can see what's going on. So instead of pornography, let's talk about normal kinds of employment. Okay. Let's say that you um, are uh, unemployed and unskilled and you need a job. And you go to a department store chain and they offer you a job to, like, to, to sweep the floor. It's a terrible job, pays little, and you have no choice. You take the job. Question, have you been coerced? The answer is no. No, 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 no. Coerced by who? By your circumstances, sure. But that's not what we mean. We mean coerced by the person offering you the job. You have not been coerced by the prospective employer. How do we know this? Because if you really wanted to, you could say no and walk away. Now, if that employer said, if you say no to this, I'm going to send my guys after you. Okay, now you're being coerced. But if you can take it or leave it, no questions asked. You are not being coerced no matter how bad the offer is. Okay? So, now we'll go back to pornography. If the person who's trying to get you to do porn is threatening you, like, if you don't do this, bad things are going to happen to you because we're going to look after you in a bad way. Okay, now, now that's, sure, that's coercion. If it's just that, you know, these women have, like, no other better choices, they don't want to sweep the floor, and pornography pays better than sweeping the floor, so I'm going to choose this instead of that, that is not coercion. That's a couple of bad choices. And you are responsible for your own life. Part and parcel of this 
is that you're responsible for your own life. And you make the choices. So, and the government cannot step in and make rules that apply to you that don't apply to everybody else. So yep. then, like, in the case of, let's say, porn or other places where people actually are coerced in that second example, they can go on decades in a situation which is dangerous that they don't leave because even though it is legal or they've been court, they don't leave because they're afraid. What, how does this framework protect people in those cases? Like, you know, do we, you are coerced into your job. The employer says, if you don't take this, I'm going to get somebody to come after you. And we know that happens all the time. There's human sure. trafficking and organized crime. There's all kinds of coercion that goes on. People enter legal agreements all the time with coercion. How do we, how do you create laws that help those people? Well, so the, the, only, the only real law you need, I mean, yeah, it'll be uh, spelled out in more detail with respect to the particular topic, but the only real rule that you need is this one. If you're not allowed to do it, then it's unlawful to do so. If it's unlawful to do so, then you can sue somebody for doing it, or if you have criminal authorities, they can prosecute for doing that. And the only question is, how possible is it to do that? Do you have a legal administration? And a, a system of justice that works better than the one we have now. The one we have now doesn't work because most of us don't have easy access to the courts. It's too expensive, it's too slow, it's too difficult, it doesn't make sense, it doesn't work. So you'd like to think that if you're gonna if you're gonna restructure everything, that you're gonna have a legal system. And I Here's, here's what I would um, suggest. Part of the reason that our administration of justice doesn't work is that we have laws coming out of the yin yang. Ever had a look at how many laws we have? Federal, provincial, municipal, statutes, regulations, guidelines, policies, and then you have the rules of the professional regulators and the, and the, and the commissions. It's like, oh, my God, if you had a simplified legal system, then you wouldn't have courts having to do such a lot of work. And one of the ideas of the rule of law is supposed to be the law is understandable. And if the law is understandable, here's the thing. If the law is understandable, now, you're always going to have great cases, always. But a good legal rule can deal with about, some people have estimated this as Richard Epstein in particular, if Richard Epstein is an American uh, professor. He says that a good legal rule, well drafted, can cover about 95% of the cases that it's supposed to. And you can tell from the rule itself whether you're on this side of the line or that one. And if you know that, you do not need to go to court. Because the court's going to tell you that, because it's clear. So the only cases that end up in the court are the 5%, where it's really great. And right now, we don't have that. We have all of the cases going to court because nobody knows, which is why it doesn't work. One of the many reasons it doesn't work. Before we go to the next question, I mentioned how funny it was. Talking about porn and calling it a sticky subject. Is that lovely? Thanks, Ralph. Well, thanks. Um, getting back to your comments on uh, social contract, um, I know there's a long philosophical and legal tradition of social contract uh, people in our, in our history. Yeah. Namely, people like uh, John Locke and Thomas Jefferson, who thought Jefferson thought we couldn't renegotiate the Constitution every 20 years, every generation. And he based a lot of his ideas on Locke, who thought that we had the right to revolution. Do you think that through our right of peaceful assembly, we could establish direct democratic citizens' assemblies and renegotiate the social contract, much like they did during the French Revolution? I, I mean, it might be preferable to what we have now, but I wouldn't put a whole lot of faith in it. I don't really trust democratic rule either. No. Right, the, 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 let's, let's put it this way. Democracy and liberty are two very different things. Because democracy allows the tyranny of the majority. And if you're a lucky majority, in this country it's the tyranny of the 
certain segment. But the whole reason for having the idea of individual rights is to say to the majority in the guise of the legislature, here are the things you can't do. So that renegotiation you're talking about, although it really should take place, the danger is that we'll be back again into the situation of the majority trying to decide where they can't go. And so it's perilous, I think. Is that why we put the liberal democracy, like the liberal part, in front of the democracy? And surely some freedom can be expanded through cooperation, you know? And that's the, the Isaiah Berlin's dichotomy of sure. positive and negative freedom. The negative freedom, <clears throat> lack of interference, the positive freedom. If we work together for safety and cooperation, we can expand our freedom. Yeah, I don't, I don't disagree with that, and you'd like to see that happen. So here's the rule of cooperation. Cooperation is central, absolutely essential. But it actually has to be voluntary cooperation. Okay? If, you're, if, if you're being encouraged to pay your taxes because it's voluntarily cooperation or cooperative, I say, no, it's not. In order for it to be cooperation, you have to be able to say no. If you can't say no, it's not cooperation. It's coercion. Okay? So if you have very small, much smaller areas of coercion, one and two, that everything else can be cooperation. And that's the way we all have it. Are you keeping track? No. <laughs> <laughs> the young woman uh, in the second row. Hi. So are you saying we have to do in order to help us? <laughs> <laughs> at the end of the day, that's what I'm hearing. I, it's not. It's not that we have nothing, but we don't have as much as we thought. Okay, that doesn't mean you have to. You, you can't even stop trying to work with what you have. But I think that in order to be most effective with the bad tools that we have, we have to understand how bad they are, and not be running on this mirage of what they actually represent. Ken? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I can ask. Uh, so I was going to ask, I, I have kids who are going to become future citizens in this world that you're saying is so ideal. How do I get them there without using coercion? <laughs> <laughs> So is, what do, what do, where do you draw the line at coercion in terms of age? Age? Oh, good question. Kids, kids are always a problem in these things. Always. <laughs> always a problem. So whenever you're talking to somebody about an idea about how the law should be, if it's controversial and they don't agree with you, well, watch what they do. They'll immediately go to the kids. Like, well, what about the kids? That's a good point. It's a totally good point. And here's the tension with the kids. The tension is between the parents and the government. <clears throat> like, who gets to say what happens to the kids? Now, for the most part, you want, I want, to be able to say it's the parents. The government should have nothing to do with it. If I wanted to decide for my children how to be educated, how to be fed, how to be vaccinated or not, it's my, my call in their best interest. And I don't want the government in it at all. On the other hand, you don't want parents who are keeping their kids in a cage in the basement and not feeding them, right? So it's a really hard question as to where the line is, and that's one of those things that's going to have to be going to have to be sorted out. But you don't want you don't want to, to save the kids in the cage. You don't want to go all the way over to the other side and say, "Well, the government's responsible for kids," because now you've just lost all of this with respect to kids. Here's where to go in order to resolve the disputes about the idea. When someone says, what about the kids? Say, no, 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 no. We'll get to the kids in a minute. First, tell me what you say in a situation that involves fully mature, competent adults. If you can agree on that, the kids, okay. So 30 years old? 30 years <laughs> <laughs> right. No, wait, wait, here's a test. Here's a test. Here's a test for you. 
and you can pick any kind of subject you want. But if you mean this, that means that people are free to make contracts for whatever they want, assuming there are consenting adults involved. That involves sex, it involves death, it involves all the bad things you can imagine. Because we mean it. And you do not want an overseeing government saying, well, yes, but not that. Because the, here, here are the two, if you believe in liberty, here are the two epiphanies you have to have. <clears throat> Sherry Tompkins. Here's the first one. The first one is easy. The first one is, I don't want to be told what to do. That's easy. Here's the second one. I don't want to tell anybody else what to do. Okay? you got to mean that one as much as the first one. If you don't mean the second one, then you don't mean it. So I'm, I haven't fully fleshed this out, but bear with me. Yes, okay. Like in a situation where we still have courts, right, and courts are interpreting this, yeah. how do we not end up in the exact same situation where we are now? Because the people who were protesting a couple weeks ago are going to interpret that very differently than I would. Absolutely. No question about it. And so in a sense, the danger is, exactly as you're saying, because we still have to rely on courts to do this adjudicating job, that's always going to be a problem. How do you try to avoid ending up in the same destination eventually? And I can only say this. There are good rules and bad ones. This is a bad one. This is a terrible rule. That's a terrible, terrible rule. You can, you can imagine a worse rule than that. Because nobody knows what it means. And nobody has any idea about what the line is. Okay? This should have been, oops, this should have been a better rule. But even that doesn't work. Right? So you've got to draft <coughs> rules that have content. Here's the ideal rule. And it's not easy. The ideal rule does two things. It, well, it avoids two things. There's a sweet spot in the middle between these two failures. One failure is to be too general and vague and aspirational and sound nice. That's the freedom of speech. The other one is to be too specific, saying, well, in this situation, you can't do X. That doesn't work. That only applies in that situation. You have to hit a sweet spot, and the sweet spot is this. It has to be abstract. Abstract enough to apply everywhere, all the time. And concrete enough that it, it demands that answer all the time. And sometimes that can be accomplished. Difficult, difficult, but that's what, that's what we're trying to get to. Thank you. Yeah. I just want to make sure I understood the question about uh, coercion and employment. So if you were to put this in the context of recently the COVID debacle, right? Yes. Um, the fallback for a lot of employers was, well, we're not really coercing you. We're just saying you can't really work here if you do this. Right. And that's not technically coercion. That's but correct. If, okay, so that's that's kind of my question. That's yeah. Well, let's deal with that though. Yeah. So is, this is this is this came up during COVID. Yes, you're working for an employer, and I'm going to <clears throat> let's imagine it's a private employer, not a government employer. If we were in a situation where we had a so-called actually free market, without all these regulations and public health rules and so on, and the employer was deciding voluntarily themselves the conditions of employment. And that employer came to you and said, you must do this in order to remain employed here. And assuming that that demand was within the bounds of the contract that you had, then they're perfectly free to do that. That is not coercion. That's bargaining. It's always bargaining. Again, if you are able to say no thank you and walk away, it's not coercion. But, in many situations during COVID, that is not what happened. What happened was coordination and direction by the state. 
Because in a free market, what would happen is you could hear the condition, decide you didn't like it, reject it, walk down the street, and bargain with a different employer who would have, would have a slightly different idea about things. It would be diverse. It would be competitive. That's not all we had. We had everybody doing exactly as they were told. And part of this new regime is not just that the government can't actually make, you know, make rules and make you do this. They can't be involved. They are not there to direct. They are not there to keep you safe. They are not there to solve social problems. They're not there to gather up revenue. They're not there to have propaganda campaigns. They are out of it. And if your employer in that situation says, got to do this or you're out, well, then so be it. Yeah. Just have a question. Uh, you mentioned that uh, the state should have and would have still those branches, and they have to be funded somehow. Yeah. But if they're not able to coerce and get taxes, right. then how would they be funded? Right. Good question. I'm not entirely sure what my answer to that is. You're going to need some kind of revenue, and you don't want user fees, I don't think necessarily, because you don't want, so here's, here's one of the basic propositions about government. You do not want governments to operate as businesses on a profit model. Uh-uh. You don't, you don't want your courts to be selling their judgments, right? So you do need some kind of minimal revenue to be able for them to operate. On the other hand, you don't want to give a full-blown taxation power to the administrative state because they'll just go overboard if they do. So, you know, how do you contain that? I'm not, I don't know yet, but it's a good question. I think that's one of the two exceptions. Right. That you need to well, you, you could, I suppose you could justify it this way, and I don't want to start, you know, throwing out justifications like social contract theory. But one justification you could do is this: you say, all right, so we have this, we have these two ideas, um, and I've suggested that because you have the first idea, in order to achieve that idea. You actually have to have the state to be able to apply force only in those situations. That's the paradox. Maybe the, the necessary taxes to, to make that possible could be lumped in with that justification. I mean, that's, that's as far as I've gotten so far. Kevin, in the back. Thank you. Thank you for your talk. Thank you very much. So I would want to talk about the set. Yes, this one here. So a caveat to that is no one is subject to any legal office by a contact without a legal So the caveat to that is that if you're not infringing on the rights of anyone else, you're not causing harm. Right. So um, to what extent can that provision apply universally when given um, lasting exceptions? live in an age now where harm is inflating to encompass yes. you know, more and more things. And yes. And there's a lot of trouble with putting out that side of the paper and all that stuff. Yes. Wouldn't have been an issue, you know, or, or, or like not uh, deemed as a criminal issue or 15 years ago. Right. Um, is it possible to have a, a universal definition of harm that applies across time and space? Okay, I'm glad you asked that question. My answer is this. This is not based upon harm. This is based upon force. If you act in a way that causes somebody harm, that is not coercive them or using force, you're totally fine. Now, just for a minute, let's imagine things as they are today. It is not a general rule that you are not allowed to cause people harm. Let's just imagine it. Let's say, let's say you are opening up a new business. And you decide to open up your business, uh, giving, I don't know, uh, your hairdresser. And you open up the business next door to the most popular hairdresser in the city. <coughs> Why? Because you want to take their business. 
Now, the objective might not be first and foremost to cause them harm, but that's part of the plan. You will give, do yourself good by causing them harm. And if you succeed, let's say you succeed beyond your wildest dreams and you make a success of it and they go out of business. You have caused them harm. Is there any liability and should there be? No, 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 no. That's the way it's supposed to work. Another example. Let's say you are campaigning for office. And you're making your claims and criticizing your opponents and saying whatever you need to say to get elected. Now, again, your objective is to get elected, but part and parcel of that is to make sure your opponent loses. You are trying to cause him harm. And if you succeed, he will lose and you will win the seat. And I can, we can go on. There are all kinds of situations in which you are fully entitled to cause other people harm. That is part and parcel of living in society. Transactions produce harm sometimes. Somebody sometimes wins and sometimes somebody loses. Harm is not a harm is not an unlawful thing in my books. It is the coercion that's wrong. And so if you speak, you say things in, in your free speech that is not a threat of physical violence, but that speech causes somebody harm, I don't give a damn. Um, I, I, I take your point and I appreciate that. But I get away we live in a time where, where um, psychological harm um, devalued and I still are very important to physical harm. And I think this is this is where uh, you, you notice that say different managers at least gain liberties. Yeah, yeah, oh well, for sure, for it's, sure. You know, it's for sure there many areas where there yeah. liberty. Right. So so let me qualify a little bit. So I, so I don't want to be taken to say that harm is always irrelevant, but it's not the cause of your legal rights. So let me give you an example. Let's say that somebody, um, let's say somebody is working on a construction site and they're walking down the, the, the sidewalk with big long two by fours and they swim around and hit you, hit you in the head and they injure you. Okay. And you sue them. The fact that they have injured you and the degree of your injury will affect how much they owe you. Right? So I'm not saying that the degree of injury is irrelevant. Sometimes you need to have the injury in order for there to be a wrong. But we're talking about those situations in which this has happened. Some variation of this, as opposed to, well, you know, you said this, or you thought this, or you did this in a way that wasn't affecting me, but I understand what you did, and it, you know, it's causing me harm. But that, that, that falls outside of this idea. Thank you. Uh, Christina? Hi. I, thanks so much for your lecture. I, this is tremendous. Um, I don't know if you want a hypothetical example. Oh, or, please, yes. Oh, okay. Because um, you spoke of authority, and if, if you have the authority to do X, Y, and Z, then you must be able to show me in law, in, in the legislation. Yeah. <clears throat> so I don't know if you're following a little bit about some of the talk. I'm going to, can I give you the exact example? Sure. Okay, so the immunizations people, of People's Act. Um, yes, yes. People's, people's, people's Act. Yeah. Um, there's some rumbles out there about how, it, okay, it, the, the principal is the only one who can, who can suspect, and it's under the Education Act, which is their legislation. Sure. But, but then the principal says, oh, the order's coming from the officer of public health of water region. So then we're, okay, well, <laughs> so I looked at both of the acts, and so the, the Immunization Act states that the officer can give an order. It doesn't say to who, it says to somebody in the school. Is that assumed that they can just put that order in, or would it have to say for the principal in order to follow that order, would it need to be in their legislation? Would it need to be specified in the Education Act that or the, the, the principal would be able to suspend under the order of the officer of health. Is it just assumed, or does it, does because we don't get the answer from the school, and we don't get the answer from public health. I have to have a look, really, to okay. answer that with any confidence. Okay. Um, but let's just back up one step, mm -hmm. and 
and put this in context. So I'm afraid the way the law works is this. So the legislation says a certain thing. And maybe it's not clear what it means. And the authorities take it to mean a certain thing. And you read it and you think, well, that's not clear or it's not what it says. That's really going back to my very first point, which is, if you have an ambiguous statutory provision, then nobody knows what it means until the court tells you. Right? So you can have this fight with them. And you can have it reasonably. You can make the good, ar good arguments. You can say, well, it says this, but not that. It says this, but not that. So therefore, you don't have this authority. And you may be right. But until somebody says, and I'm taking you to a court to find out, then nobody cares. Right? right? And to add insult to injury, it is quite possible when you're dealing with a public official that that public official, depending upon the context, might be entitled to the deference that I mentioned from the courts. So it might be that you are right on a strict wording of the provision you're talking about. Maybe the best interpretation is the one you're giving it. But it is also possible that a court, given the nature of our administrative law as it now exists, will say, well, we don't want to interfere in their assessment of what their marching orders are. So on this judicial review, our the, the, the standard of review that we're going to apply here is not correctness. In other words, you take this to a court and you think, you assume that when you take something to a court, the court is there to give you the answer about what the law is. But our administrative law says that in some circumstances, dealing with public authorities who are interpreting their statutes and making these decisions, they don't have to be correct. They only have to be reasonable. And what they mean by reasonable is not so unreasonable as to be, as to make no sense. Okay? So the court is a place to go, but that doesn't mean you're going to get the answer that you want. Yeah. Thanks so much. It's a really thought-provoking talk, and I want to make an observation. I've been to talks on the far left where the basic two points are the system's rotten to the core, and we need to burn it all down. Right. Those are essentially the same two points <laughs> that I get from your talk. Oh. From the other side. Right. So I'm going to ask a conservative question, okay. even though I'm not a conservative, okay. which is if we wanted to maintain basically the system we have, yeah. let's keep democracy. We're probably not going to change the entire system overnight, or at least not within, you know, the, the... So if we want to fix some of these things yeah. that have gone so wrong, and I think quite wrong, like even over the last couple of decades, things have really slipped yeah. and slipped and slipped. Yeah. So how do we draw some lines that are maybe more possible to draw in our lifetimes, in the short term, to, to say no to all of this slipping and all of the, you know, is there something about the process that's happening where we can have more guardrails in place, we can sort of put a, put a stop to that without changing everything all at once? Uh, it's a great question, and my, I mean, there, there, there are lots of things that could be done if we could get there. It's the getting there that's the problem. For my money, the most important thing is to change people's minds about this. If you ask anybody on the street about whether we should have an administrative state, first of all, they don't know what, I don't know what you mean. But once they do figure it out, they're going to say, well, but what else is government for but to solve social problems? Everybody in life today has grown up in a society with a, an overbearing administrative state. That's what they think government is. And I think the first stage down this very long, difficult path is to convince people that this is not the way government has to be. And that the government itself in this form is the source of most of your trouble. You turn the corner on that and then throw in the terrible access to justice that we have, the courts that don't work, that are too expensive, too slow, to, you know, that's a huge, huge problem as well. But if you, if you started to make progress in the minds of people about those two things, then you sort of get the wheels to move a little bit. 
That, that would be my vote. Mr. Actually, Are there any other kind of weak links in a deference or delegation kind of links of this evil that could be targeted by a future government that might be a little bit wiser than the current set? Is there anything that might be legislatively undermined oh. in the near future? Well, you see, if, if you had a government elected who was determined to undo a lot of this stuff, they could do a lot very easily. Like, they can't change the Constitution, right? But a lot of this delegation is in the legislation. If you are a, if you are a party in control of the legislature, you can just repeal all the statutes that give all this delegated authority. Okay? Just take it away. It's like, you know, no, you can't pass regulations on these things. No, the, no, the commission cannot make policies on these things. We're putting you out of business. It can be done with a simple majority vote in the House. What about the deference side? Is that under? That yeah, deference side is in the whole, hands of the courts. And there's nothing you can do about that. Now, here's, here's what I would try if I, was a, if I was a government, a new government determined to fix this. Here's what I would try. I would say, all right, we're going to pass legislation changing this rule. And then the ball would be in the court's side. And they would decide whether or not they were going to accept that legislation could legitimately do this, or whether or not they were essentially making a constitutional decision about the nature of judicial review. If they decide it's constitutional or quasi-constitutional, they're not going to accept the legislation. But there's a lot of commentary inside the jurisprudence of administrative law that says that statutes are very important. And these signals they give are very important. You might just make a lot of progress if you are very clear in your roster of statutes that said, "No, no, we do not want we do not want you to give them deference. We expect our administration to be correct." I think that might make a lot of progress. Uh, yes. The opinion writing a document together for the last. Uh couple of weeks. So we're on the same side. So you'll forgive me if I ask you. Sure. Hostile. So yeah, 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 great. Good. So it was interesting to me that you got us to the this utopia of the the consent. Yeah. With a long story which started in um, kind of uh, mid medieval England. <laughs> and um, and that tells me something. So if I looked at that story, the story that you know, I'm a sociologist, so I think Norbert Elias or Huizinger or all those kind of people. Uh -huh. And so it's set in a very particular society, an Anglophone history, and you kind of made reference to that. Yeah. Um, and I think just thinking about it, it, it the, the, the sort of, even though you're, you're cautious about getting from A to B, but the B that you're talking about, it couldn't happen in with the newer in Sudan, and it couldn't happen with uh, in, in sort of Viking Norway, and it couldn't happen in, um, I mean, pretty well anywhere except in Anglophone countries here and now, maybe in a hundred years' time. Right. So what? So 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 in that in that case, you're, you're kind of posing this kind of universal um, sort of solution based on a kind of an underlying anthropology, mm -hmm. um, but you're skating over. Mm -hmm the sort of the deep process of formation because mm -hmm. so this is a conservative point I don't think you can have this mm -hmm. I think you can, you can have it unless you have a much more communitarian kind of process of the formation of a certain type of individual mm -hmm. which means that that first uh, provision mm -hmm. would be subject to much more kind of horizontal communitarian uh, uh, sort of Coercion, essentially, the kind of right. coercion that we coerce right. our kids. With. So that's a socially, and I, so I want, I want you to say something about the anthropology underneath, mm. if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. So, if the, if if I can put it this way, this is the tension between between uh, an idea and and human behavior. And you're talking about human behavior as it evolves differently in different contexts, different places, different histories, and so on. I'll give you that, no problem. But the idea doesn't change depending upon where you are. The, the idea is independently 
what it is. And let me put it this way. If you don't have this, I'm, I'm going to use a, a, a truism. If you don't have this, then you are being coerced. Right? The rule is no coercion. You don't have the rule, you're being coerced. Right? So, you, you're probably right. But to get from A to B in these various places you mentioned, like, how are you going to do that? Because inside these societies are pressures and tensions and forces and so on. I respond to the conservative objection to this kind of idea this way. I say, actually, if you think of all those social pressures to conform to this or to that, I got no problem with any of those. Here's the only proviso. If the coercion is legally voluntary, as in not coercion at all, if you are allowed to say no, even though the social pressure is enormous, even though you wouldn't expect people in Norway, in Viking Norway, to say no, because they're Vikings. If they're allowed to, then it's voluntary. But, but that means it only works if you've got a, a reservoir of Christian virtue, which has been built up over a thousand years since we internalized What do you mean by works? Well, it, it, it only becomes thinkable. Someone like you can only have the thoughts that you're articulating now mm. um, with that 2,000 years of history. In, in a way, you're a product of uh, mm -hmm. you know, sure. 18th and 19th century sure. liberal sure. M market sure, sure, uh, sure. society. Yeah. And, 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 and so, um, so you're, you're building on a foundation. Yeah. So you, your system can't produce the foundation. Uh, I'm not going to, I'm not sure I'm going to give you that. I'll, I'll, I'll give you the, I'll, I'll give you the, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the genesis of, of the product, for sure. But the assessment of the validity of the product is not dependent upon its history. It, it, it's a thing or it's not. And it applies to all people everywhere or it doesn't. Now, it might not work the same way everywhere. And a lot of places, most places, maybe all places, it's not going to be accepted for the kinds of reasons that you're alluding to. People, going back to my two things, don't want to be told what to do, don't want to tell other people what to do. The second one is exceedingly rare. <laughs> <laughs> Almost non-existent. Let me put it this way. People in most places are not going to accept this because they don't not want to tell people what to do, whether you're a Viking or not. And I think your point, this is most likely to be accepted in, you know, an Anglo-liberal democratic system. Is, are, are we getting closer to each other? Yeah, We've, that's the most tense and interesting intellectual uh, exchange that I've had in in 12 years. <laughs> it hasn't happened once in, in the department where so maybe I should come down the world. Yeah. <laughs> so alone, I think we'll take a few points. Can okay. I jump in? Yeah. Um, so just going back to the, if you were to take away deference from the courts. Yes. I'm wondering how you would work around precedents that have been set by certain cases, like the first case that you presented. How, how do you get around that if you do take away the deference? There is. Then, then there's contradictions in terms of the legislature and the, co and the court's decisions throughout the past. Okay, so, fair. Here's, here's a couple of rules about how the system works now. And these are not bad rules. So you have judge-made law, common law, or even court's decisions about what statutes mean. Those are precedents. They are binding on lower courts and on future courts. However, the legislature can pass statutes. And those statutes can contradict what the courts have held. So now you have two things. You have a statute that says one thing and the common law that says something else. In that conflict, what trumps? And the answer is always the statute. A statute, a statute can change the common law any way it wants to, as long as it says that it does. 
Okay, so there's really no contribution there at all. We really just have time for one question because we lose the classroom. There's a class in here afterwards. And I do want to give you guys a chance to chat with each other. I think that's a really valuable part of this. So who hasn't asked a question? Yeah, go for it. Hi. Um, I apologize in advance. I'm not really in like political, so I'm a doctor in the lab. I don't do this. But the same question, this is what I always have to people who propose things like this, because I agree with it, like your two rules. And I understand that if you were to introduce like three, four, or five, it automatically breaks apart the system of rule one and two, like helping each other. So you know more than you think you do. <laughs> <laughs> but my issue always is like, it doesn't, there are things that are objectively immoral. Like my example would be torturing animals. And would you really say that you would be okay in that kind of society as like we're not in a sort of environment where we are at that stage, like we're not in the past time, you know what I mean, sorry. Sure. We're in the modern age. Sure, sure. So you would be okay with a law system that doesn't protect animals from something. It's a really good question. Really good question. A, a sticky question. Sticky question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let, let me, so there's there's two difficult parts of your question, and one is the subject matter, the animals right here, and the other one is the is the proposition about objective morality. Okay. I'm, my, that one's one of my favorites. Let me do that one first. This is difficult for people to swallow. I, I'm not here to make a case that there is no such thing as morale. Not at all. I believe that there is. And I also believe that I know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the problem, right? Whenever you purport to understand what it is, that part's fine. It's the next step that's a real problem, which is, and I intend to enforce it. Because now you can't prove that what you know to be true is actually true. So, even if there is a morality for our governance, we have to pretend that there isn't. Because otherwise, all you have is force. Right? So that brings us to the problem of the, of the animal torture. I don't want animals to be tortured. But how do we get there? How do we get there unless we start to wander away from these two ideas? And I would like to think, actually this, this relates to the point that you were making, right? Yeah. Because it is, a, it is, I think it's incorrect to say to ourselves, because this is where we've ended up in our society. Our, the guides to our behavior the signals, the directions, they, they come from the government. That is not the way things are supposed to be. We are supposed to be a society of interacting people. And I would like to think that even if we didn't have a law, you'd have enough dynamics in the society that everybody would agree, if not everybody, then most people would agree, listen, you can't do that, you can't do that to a cast. And those outliers would get enough social approbation that they might give it up. So, I still don't think it ought to be a law. But I do think, I'd like, like to hope that we would look after it so that that could happen. Maybe I'll close with a quote apropos of this. Uh, Liberty lies in the hearts of men and women. When it dies there, no constitution, no law, no court can even do much to help it. While it lies there, it needs no constitution, no law, no court to save it. That's learned hand. I want to thank Bruce Party for our <laughs>